All right, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I wanna welcome all of our guests who are here with us in person, and I wanna welcome everyone joining our live broadcast as well. I'm Damon Wilson, President and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. And this evening, we are gathered for a very special program, a global turning point, a celebration of Larry Diamond. Larry, welcome back to the endowment, an institution which reflects so many of your ideas, an institution that has been molded by your contributions. You were surrounded by friends, colleagues, and activists tonight whose lives you have impacted through your work, through your intellect, and through your heart. So tonight, after more than 30 years of contribution to NED and our mission of supporting democracy and freedom around the world, we now come together to thank you, to honor you, to celebrate you. And we need to take a little inspiration from Larry as well. So tonight we will present Larry with the Endowment's Democracy Service Medal. The NED board, represented by our chairman, Ken Wallach, who you'll be hearing from, created this highest honor in 1999 to recognize individuals who have demonstrated through personal commitment their dedication to the advancement of freedom, human rights, and democracy. Larry's dedication has been extraordinary, as all of you well know, and as we will hear and discuss tonight. Larry, of course, is a well, world-renowned scholar, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Mossbacker Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He is also, of course, founding co-editor of the Journal of Democracy, along with Mark Platner, who is with us this evening. Larry's also served as co-chair of the International Forum's Research Council, has advised the Forum, our fellowship program, and NED more generally since its founding, something that Carl Gershman will speak to, I hope. But beyond the titles, beyond these roles, Larry combines a sharp intellect with passion, with moral conviction, with relentless commitment to the cause of democracy. And we're honoring Larry as he has stepped down from his role as editor earlier this year. Together, Mark and Larry led the journal for over 30 years, and together, they made the journal into the most consequential forum for debate and ideas about democracy, not to mention the most widely read journal on the Johns Hopkins platforms. Larry's intellectual leadership has literally helped shape the endowment, the International Forum for Democratic Studies, our fellowship program, the journal itself over these decades. Indeed, in his last issue in January of this year, Larry published a remarkable essay, Democracy's Arc, from resurgence to imperiled, which traces the arc of democracy over the lifetime of the journal. The Journal of Democracy began publishing in 1990, in which he wrote, it was an era of hopeful, even exhilarating expansion of democracy around the world. Democracy was on the march, not only literally on the ground and at the ballot box, but normatively and intellectually. He guided the journal with Mark into a darker period of global democratic recession beginning in 2006 that has only sharpened in recent years and continues today, arguably making the journal's work even more important. He concludes his journal, a tenure at the journal at a time in which he argues, democracy faces its most daunting test in many decades. This article that he wrote is, as a concluding essay in the journal of his tenure there was so intertwined with the, inter, with the trajectory of the endowment itself and our own grant making, our own research that I asked Larry if he would come back to participate in a town hall with NED staff alone, not a public event, but just for the NED staff, so they could have a chance to hear from him and talk to him at the end of that remarkable tenure. And we did that just last Monday on May 9th. Larry, of course, was brilliant. But what made it so special was that two of our young staff members moderated the conversation with him, Justin Daniels, an assistant editor of the journal, who was Larry's student at Stanford, Michaela Cole, an assistant program officer with our fellows program, with which Larry has so often served as a mentor, and they did an excellent job. But what the town hall underscored was that in addition to his intellect, he has a passion for serving as a mentor, as an advocate for supporting rising talent in this field. It takes time to nurture the spirit and intellect of the next generation. And Larry, along with Frank Fukuyama, who's with us, and so many of their colleagues at Stanford have been ensuring a new generation of intellectuals and activists are equipped to advance the cause of democracy. 
Indeed, I look forward to joining both of you at Draper Hills this summer, the Summer Fellows Program they created in 2005 to train global leaders working on the front lines of democratic change. They've made the investment in passing on the torch. So when I travel around the world and I meet our grant grantees, whether in Nigeria or Ukraine, they know Larry. They've been influenced by his ideas. And they realize that his ideas are influenced by them. And that really matters to them. He grounds his work in the reality of activists. But they've also been touched by his commitment, his solidarity, and his dedication. Larry, your fan club is indeed global. This quality, the combination of intellect and advocacy, makes Larry a rare character. His influence has literally touched every corner of the world from foreign leaders and domestic dignitaries to other scholars and activists. I know it's touched me. I share Larry's deep concern about the moment that we are in. Yes, in many places around the world, the bad guys are winning, as Ned, board member Ann Applebaum, has written. But the existential nature of this challenge is in large part why I found it so compelling to join the endowment at this tough time. Our work, the work we support around the world, has never been more important. And in that regard, I also share Larry's optimism. Only by supporting those who are partners around the world civic activists and organizers, independent journalists and academics, labor unions, business associations, and democratic institutions and political actors, only by supporting them will we succeed in coming out of this recession and ending this democratic recession. Together, those on the front lines who have inspired Larry and who Larry inspires will help ensure that there will be ultimately a fourth democratic wave. So I want to close our opening here just by reading Larry's concluding thoughts in his final Journal of Democracy article. This is the darkest moment for freedom in half a century, he wrote. I have faith in democracy's long-run prospects because it is morally superior system, and because it has proven over time to be more effective at meeting human needs, growing economies, protecting the environment, respecting human rights, and controlling corruption. In addition, it is human nature to seek personal autonomy, dignity, and self-determination. And with economic development, those values have become ascendant. But there is nothing inevitable about the triumph of democracy. In this new era, the strategies and choices of democratic states and leaders will have consequences that will resonate for decades. Can the world's democracies manage their divisions and rally the resolve to meet the challenge posed by resurgent authoritarianism. Antonio Gramsci urged pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Only a clear-eyed recognition of the depth of the current peril can generate the necessary will. And he concludes with, I remain optimistic. It's awesome. It's just awesome, Larry. We are so honored tonight to reflect on Larry's intellectual and moral leadership, and later in the program, to award him our Democracy Service Medal. We have an extraordinary program tonight of remarkable activists, thinkers. We'll get to that soon. But to continue the program, I want to call your attention to our screens. We have a special message from Larry Stan Larry's Stanford colleague, my former boss, former National Security Advisor, the 66th Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. Thank you for allowing me to join you for a moment uh, as the National Endowment for Democracy uh, bestows up on Larry its Democracy Service Medal. I can't be with you there in person, but I'm really glad to be there with you in spirit. I simply can't think of a more appropriate recipient for this award than my friend and colleague, Larry Diamond. Larry, you have done so much for the forward progress of democracy getting others to write about it and think about it in your leadership and stewardship of the Journal of Democracy. As a scholar whose work helped us understand why democracy works and why sometimes it doesn't, and to give us new insights into how we might bring about democratic change in places that had never had the benefit of the very rights that we enjoy as Americans. You've been a teacher 
a person who's passed on that passion for democracy and understanding it and pushing it forward among countless students here at Stanford and uh, frankly across the country and across the world. You have been an advocate and an activist for democracy in places as far flung as Iraq, in Africa, in Eastern Europe, those who are on the front lines in trying to bring a better life and a more democratic future to their countries have found you as an ally. They have found you as someone who's committed, who believes in them. And that has made you perhaps the most important title that I can give you, a friend of those who struggle against tyranny. Larry, it is because you really do believe that no man, woman, or child should be condemned to, to live in tyranny. It is because you believe that everybody has the DNA for democracy. It is because you believe that people, when given a choice, will choose to have control of their futures. Because you're a believer, you've been a friend, an advocate, a teacher, a scholar, you have been a force for the democratic movement. You, like all of us, have been concerned about sometimes the fact that democracy doesn't move in a straight line, but you've never lost your passion. You've never lost your optimism. You've never lost your belief. And for that, I thank you on behalf of all of us who want to see a more democratic and prosperous future for the world. And so Larry, again, congratulations on this award. Thank you to all of you at the National Endowment for Democracy who do this hard work. Have a good evening and God bless. Everyone has the DNA for democracy, brilliant. So now we're gonna turn over to the Brain Trust of the Journal for Democracy to discuss its evolution over the decades and for this session, we're pleased to have the two current co-editors of the journal, Tarek Masood and William Dobson, joining Larry in this conversation. And for those of you who have not met Tarek Masood, we are so lucky after a long search that Will and Larry helped lead together to bring Tarek into the family. He's a Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Governance at Harvard University's Kennedy School, the Director of the Middle East Initiative, the Initiative on Democracy in Hard Places. We are delighted to have you here in person to, to join this conversation. And Will Dobson, of course, the co-editor of the Journal for Democracy, former chief international editor at NPR, with a remarkable book of his own on the dictator's learning curve. Will, over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Damon. Um, so uh, it's, it's just such a pleasure uh, to be here with everyone tonight and to have this opportunity to share the stage with two remarkable people. Um, and two co-editors uh, in the club, the very small club of co-editors that exist out there with Mark Blattner here as well. Um, I, you know, we, we to do this right, uh, Tark and I both felt very strongly that um, we had to both interview you, really. Um, and, but I want to assure you at the outset that this really is a celebration and not a roast. Um, you know, um, I, a little bit of a roast. Maybe a little bit of a roast. Um, you know, for myself, um, I have to say that, you know, I first met Larry like I think so many people did, which was through his work. It was through his writing. It was in the pages of the Journal of Democracy. Uh, and that was many, many years ago. Uh, and over the course of uh, my career, working at many other publications and across the media, I was consistently working in places that was always showcasing Larry's ideas, often in our pages, on our air. Um, but I never had the opportunity to directly work with Larry. Um, then I worked on a book that took me across the globe and I was meeting activists in Venezuela and Russia and Egypt and just as Damon said, they all knew Larry. Uh, in fact, many of them had met Larry. Larry had come to them and he had visited with them. He had sat at their table. I had not met Larry. Uh, and, and, and as I moved through, this, through my career, I eventually had this incredible opportunity to come to the journal. And of course, among the many reasons to join the journal, one of them that was so compelling, so amazing, was the prospect that I would be colleagues 
with Larry Diamond. And so in that very first conversation, when I had accepted the position and we were, were now officially colleagues and we, he was so welcoming and so encouraging, and then he said, oh, Will, I'm leaving in two years. <laughs> and so with could that, have been one. <laughs> could have been one. Uh, and, and, and so with, so I should be grateful. Uh, and so for that, I mean, I knew right away that, you know, Larry was going to set the parameters. Uh, I, this begins and this will also end. Um, and so I did everything I could over those two years to t sort of delay that process, but you're not going to deter Larry. Larry had set the course. And so, and so we are very fortunate to have Tarek join us, someone who's been a deep, um, good friend of mine for a long time. Um, and, you know, in two years with Larry is not nothing. That's like a master's degree, right? So um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very uh, lucky for that time. Larry, w you know, we, you know, very much with what Damon was saying, we, that's exactly where I wanted to begin the conversation was with the essay that you wrote for us uh, in the January issue, um, where, you, where you wrote that this was uh, the darkest chapter uh, of the last half century and that you maintain this optimism. I'm, it's very rare that you can have an author write words such as that and then have an opportunity to update on that sentiment just a few months later when so much has happened. When we're at a moment where clearly Vladimir Putin miscalculated, where we have seen an incredible, extraordinary response from the Ukrainian people, um, when we have seen the West respond the way that they have, I mean, just early hours ago today, of Finland and Sweden jointly submitting their application to, to NATO. I, I'm curious, if you would amend what you said in January, if you would update what you would say, do you feel it's still the darkest chapter, darkest moment? Uh, are you more optimistic than you even were in January? Where, does, where do you sit with that now? Well, uh, thank you, Will. Uh, thank you, Tarek, as well. And I just want to say for everyone here and the world watching, I am just so thrilled ab about the new leadership team at the Journal of Democracy. In your case, not so new, case of Tarek since January, but I I'm just spectacularly happy uh, to have the two of you carrying the Journal of Democracy forward together. And it was a great, really, uh, Will, I will say, uh, just such a pleasure to work with you for the time that um, I was able to. And my, you know, I'm waiting by the phone for the call for <laughs> continued engagement. Um, so I think there are things that have happened since I wrote, finished that essay in early December that um, have given us all, I think, new hope, new resolve, uh, and uh, new rational grounds for believing that we could be on the cusp of a fourth wave, the magic idea, the magic term that we've all kind of been thinking about and debating for a while. But there are other developments and trends um, that give me great pause and very, very deep worry. Um, I believe, um, as Huntington, who introduced the term uh, waves of democracy, believed, um, and uh, as I can say, my late mentor, um, who was a recipient of this Democracy Service Medal, and who I'll make reference to again later, uh, believed, uh, Seymour Martin Lipset, that there is no country in the world that is more important to the future of democracy than the United States. Uh, and I'm not going to here uh, at this platform, in this building, in this institution, talk about the details of the plight that uh, American democracy faces uh, in any depth. I think this just is, this is not part of the writ of the endowment. Uh, I don't want to get into it. Um, but um, I think I can make the following two statements on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, one is that across party lines, uh, the majority of Americans believe that democracy is in very serious danger. Uh, they are more polarized uh, on a mass basis, forget about um, the nearly perfect polarization of congressional voting behavior. Fortunately, not on Ukraine, by the way. That is something that also gives us hope uh, than they've been at any time since the Civil War era. 
Uh, and I believe there is a very significant chance of a breakdown of American democracy uh, in the coming years. I'm very worried about a crisis surrounding the 2024 election. Beyond that, um, there are a number of other things that I can update that worry me. First of all, can you believe it? Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has just been elected president of the Philippines with Duterte's daughter as his vice president. I mean, this is likely to yield the nail in the coffin of democracy in the Philippines, even though I don't think Philippines for the last several years under Duterte's merciless assault on democracy has been a democracy. Bolsonaro will probably lose in Brazil, which could put democracy in much deeper danger there, but that's by no means guaranteed. And look, aside from the United States, I think the most important country to the future of democracy in the world is India for two reasons. Number one, it's the biggest democracy in the world. And it's probably now, by the way, already um, the most populous country in the world. If you talk to Jack Goldstone, who's the leading political demographer in the United States. Thank you for coming, Jack. I think he'll confirm what I'm saying, that China's probably been inflating its population figures. So India is probably already the most populous country. But also read The Economist magazine. This is a country that's poised for potentially 7 to 8% growth for you know, the next 10 to 20 years. But is it going to achieve that? Well, not if it you know, plunges into needless, gratuitous uh, religious polarization and and violence, which is the way Modi is taking the country. Peru, a non-trivial country, a a very significant country in South America, is uh, is just going deeper and deeper and deeper into the dark hole of political crisis. And we could have a breakdown of democracy in Peru at almost any time. I doubt there are five people in the United States government who are really paying much attention to this. And so um, it's just a very mixed picture. On the negative side, I could elaborate on what I said. On the positive side, in addition to the extraordinarily rallying uh, of the uh, Western alliance um, around the Ukrainian cause, which is the most important cause of our time, Uh, You know, the people of Sri Lanka are rallying against the Rajapaksa dictatorship. Uh, They're the family, and it is really the family, in quotation marks, is on the run. And so they could swing back in a democratic direction. And I think it is, the, the best way to put it is, it is the most fluid moment for democracy, probably in decades, and it really could swing in either direction. So, so Larry, this is this is great. I mean, your encyclopedic knowledge of the fate of democracy in probably every single country in the world is uh, breathtaking. So, you know, to come back to that article and and to to, to um, address some of the things you just talked about now. I mean, in that article, you point to two things that need to happen in order for the democratic recession to be reversed or halted, and. One of them, it seems to be that you think, you know, there needs to be a lot more work done to shore up the legitimacy of democracy, you know, with the average citizen. If you look, for example, at World Values Survey data, or you look at the article by, uh, the articles by our, our colleagues, Yasha Monk and uh, Roberto Fo, there's a lot of um, loss of faith in democracy. And so clearly we need to shore up faith of the average citizen, particularly in some of these places that are on the bubble. How do we do that? The second thing that you point to is you say, look, some of the most difficult cases that looked like they were going to go authoritarian and then pulled back from the brink, they were able to do that because they had leaders who were committed to democracy. You say they were by no means angelic, but they were committed to democratic institutions. And so how do we do those two things? How do we you know, convince citizens that democracy really is, as you said, and as Damon quoted in the end of your essay, the, you know, a really good system of government. It's got a lot going for it. And then two, how do, where do we get those leaders who will actually shore up and, and rescue democracy? Okay, wow. Um, so on the legitimacy front, um, I believe uh, that you know, we can go back to my mentor, <laughs> Marty Lipset. Probably won't be the last time 
until 6 p.m. Eastern time tonight that I do it, um, and think about what the determinants are of legitimacy. And so one of them is performance. And democracies are just going to have to perform better in meeting the challenges that people face. And I think a major reason for the erosion of support for democracy around the world has been disappointment with its economic and political performance. Now, if you back up from that, um, you see that there are a lot of determinants of performance. One is policy choice and the ideas or ideologies um, uh, that contribute to it. I'm in the middle of Frank's great new book, Liberalism and Its Discontent, and I won't give away his punchlines, but I think there are some important insights there about um, what makes for um, the kind of broad-based, uh, sustainable, just economic policies uh, and the guideposts, and to some extent the flexibility and correction and learning from experience uh, that can achieve that. Uh, and uh, this is very much kind of my thinking, my personality, but I think it jumps out from a lot of literature as well, avoiding dogma, avoiding extremes, uh, this sort of thing. Anyway, effective performance is crucial. And then institutions are, are important in two respects. First of all, if you don't have functional institutions, go back to Frank's book on books on political order, um, then you know, what you have is a vitocracy or some other you know, manifestly deficient institutions you may not be able to get the performance you need. That's the first thing. The second thing is we know uh, from so much literature, going back to Aristotle, who Marty admired, Marty himself, so many recent scholars, many now who've written for the Journal of Democracy, that you know, sustained deep partisan and ideological polarization are deadly for democracy. And you know, they've played a major story in the death of democracy. And so there are things we have learned about institutional design that can uh, diminish polarization. And um, we should be learning some of those lessons um, for all democracies, not just new democracies, but established ones. And I've been saying for a long time, I'm going to say again, this is also not a partisan uh, statement, that if you have a country that has partisan primaries, with extremely low voter turnout, which tends to be the pattern, where you know uh, seven or eight percent of the voting age public can determine who's going to be the nominee of a party, and then you know in some districts or states that will largely determine who wins, and that seven or eight percent of the public is more ideologically motivated to turn out to vote, more passionate about it. Well. That's going to contribute to polarization. And the leaders? Where do we get the oh, leaders? Oh, the leaders. Um, well, two points about leaders. One is that um, it's pretty rare to get a Lincoln. Uh, uh, otherwise, we'd have a lot more stable democracies in the world. And it's rare to get great and democratically committed leadership. You know, Jim Abwadi and I were talking last night about the Ghanaian experience. Maybe Jima can elaborate on this when he comes up. And, you know, he was reflecting on the time what had been my instinct, that the person who was elected to the Ghanaian presidency after Rawlings left, thank God, in 2000, John Kufour, um, was probably the best president Ghana ever had. At the time, no one thought of him as a great president or a Lincoln-esque president. He just observed the two um, uh, uh, principles of your Harvard colleagues, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, mutual tolerance and mutual forbearance. He didn't abuse power. He wasn't massively corrupt. He respected democracy. He gave, you know, like George Washington, who Marty also wrote about, he made it very clear he was leaving after uh, two terms and wasn't going to try and monkey with the Constitution. And so... 
you know, that kind of leadership, it tends to be rare. So you need very strong guardrails mm -hmm. and you need strong institutional norms against the abuse of power. And that, that means then everything else, political culture, civic education, civil society, strong independent media. Sometimes you also get a Zelensky. Yeah. And you said a moment ago that this is, if, if anything marks this moment, it's the fluidity, um, which I think also suggests that there's an opportunity here. Um, and that if, if, if we agree that um, in recent years, democracies have done a poor job of filling the narrative void of telling their story against uh, a China, for example, that has told a story, um, a questionable story about its own uh, performance and what it can deliver and, that, and the strings that are or are not attached with that. Um, what, what can be done now in this moment if there is a wrinkle, if there is this fluidity to seize this moment? What should democracies be doing to take advantage of whatever this opportunity is that is here now? Because it, we know, if anything, with fluidity, it's also fleeting. So what would you advise? Well, I, I think the uh, greatest unmet need lies in the realm where the Journal of Democracy is, fairly pl is, is firmly placed, and the International Forum, and all the work Chris Walker uh, and his colleagues uh, in the research and ideas part of the endowment are doing on kleptocracy and sharp power and so on. It's in the realm of ideas and the, and the battle for um, what I call, I think in that article, but it's a term that has had a very, very deep impact on my thinking. It's the German term, term Zeitgeist, uh, the spirit of the times. And um, it, it's, it's the battle of ideas, of information, of understanding, of shaping the narrative, where, where I think the highest priority, other than you know rolling back uh, Russian aggr aggression in Ukraine and standing firm with Taiwan and so on and meeting the hard security challenge, um, the challenge of confronting sharp power, which is Chinese and Russian propaganda uh, and illiberal so soft power needs to be waged. And I think the endowment um, is doing a lot in this regard. I have a lot of admiration for its work. I'll repeat that these two projects on kleptocracy and sharp power at NET, I think, have been absolutely trailblazing. But um, I think the United States is lagging. And uh, don't take it from me. Don't take it from any kind of soft, mushy democracy advocate. Take it from the former um, chief of um, uh, the National Intelligence Council, the former head of national intelligence uh, of the United States, James Clapper, who wrote in his book a few years ago, Facts and Fears, something, he, it's not coming from me, but I virtually said the same thing. We need, to re, we need a new US information agency on steroids. That was his term. Uh, because we are completely outmatched vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the People's Republic of China in waging this battle of information and ideas. And I think we've gotten a little better in the last uh, year or two, and we've got the Global Engagement Center at the State Department that's trying to do some good work in this area, but it's not nearly enough. It's not enough money, it's not enough attention, it's not enough innovation, it's not uh, you know, uh, assertive enough, it's not imaginative enough. We are up against a monster now in terms of the disinformation machines of China, Russia, uh, Iran, and other malign states in the world, and we have not adequately risen to that challenge. So, Larry, I mean, just, you know, seeing the passion with which you uh, speak about this uh, issue, I mean, it's really, really extraordinary. So when Will and I were trying to make a plan for how we would uh, do this interview, I said, you know, we should do something Different. We should do something like, you know, those interviews that that fellow in Inside the Actor Studio used to do and ask you about your favorite color and, you know, what do you think, you know, uh, what do you think of marshmallows and things like that? Here and, are my favorite and, colors, <laughs> blue and gold. And, and, and uh, Will, was, as is becoming a pattern in our co-editorship, Will steered me to this question, which is basically a question about, you know, how does 
the person that sits before us and who speaks so passionately about democracy and who has this belief that I find quite inspiring in uh, the United States as a force for good, as a force for democracy. How does that person emerge? What is the origin story of that hero for democracy? So what, what's the earliest memory you have of actually caring about democracy? Uh, the earliest concrete memory, which I think some people in this room know, is John F. Kennedy's inaugural address in January of 1961, where he said, you know, roughly the famous words, we will pay, pay any price, bear any burden, meet any challenge, etc. Uh, befriend any friend, uh, you know, stand up to any foe to sustain uh, the battle uh, and win the battle for freedom in the world. Um, you know, I think, too, there are many great speeches on uh, democracy, but two of the most important ones were that one and then Reagan's Westminster Address, which I'll come back to later. And um, uh, it had a very profound impact on me. I'm watching the Kennedy-Nixon debates. I'm now dating myself. Neither of you <laughs> were around at the time. But it, it was pretty, pretty inspiring. And... Um, I can elaborate, uh, Tarek, by saying that I am of a generation that was and remains proud to be anti-communist. I'm just anti-totalitarian in, in all forms. And um, uh, I, I don't apologize for it. Um, I think totalitarianism Communism, fascism, these are, these are evil ideologies, uh, and any threat to human freedom um, is something that is just very visceral for me. Uh, two, uh, the two books that had the biggest impact on me growing up, again, you know, from a very early age, I know this is, is trite, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, were Animal Farm and uh, 1984. Uh, but you know, bought the, the books for you, huh? Who got those books for you? M my parents. Yeah. Uh, and finally, I will say yes. My parents. My father was an immigrant from Canada. My mother, uh, and then before that from England, and before that from Poland. Uh, we're all from the Pale of Settlement. My uh, my mother's father, you know, and his brothers, uh, they hid under uh, you know hay in a cart to escape from being drafted um, into the Tsar's army, uh, you know, maybe uh, early 1900s, about a decade before the outbreak of World War I, and kind of barely made it out of what is now Belarus um, in a situation where pogroms were a recent experience for them. So there's all of that. So um, I think I'm responsible for keeping us on time, and that's uh, really dangerous when you put an Egyptian <laughs> in charge of timekeeping. But one thing we did want to ask you before we end is just what's the next chapter? Well, um, for me uh, to continue as much as possible, to um, have an opportunity to work with, uh, engage, and advise this great institution, uh, both the journal uh, and the endowment, uh, I want to write a textbook about democratic development, the conditions uh, for successful democracy. As Condi said, why democracies develop and thrive and why they fail, uh, but you know, do it in a way that can it be accessible to all the people that we've been trying to train and engage and partner with at the endowment. That's great. Well, look, Will started by, um, you know, uh, offering a, a, a very touching testimonial to what you mean to him. I, I will say, um, if, I, if I could just for a second, you know, um, I feel uh, really awed and humbled by the opportunity to carry on your work. And I, you know, I'm full of self-loathing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I often think to myself, uh, can I, can I do this? Is this an entirely undeserved thing? And I've concluded that it is entirely undeserved. 
Um, but I'm going to spend uh, all the time that I'm, I'm given to do this job trying to earn it. And uh, Larry, it Very means well. it's the greatest honor of my life to, to help carry on this work and, and to, to follow in your footsteps. So thank you for everything you've done. Great. And the fact that you're on time, <laughs> I mean, it's such an encouraging, an encouraging start. You know, you're, you're a quick learner. So thank you, thank Larry. You thank you. Thank you. Great opening conversation, and Larry, your your answer about your continuing contribution to the cause and to the endowment, I think warms uh, many of our hearts here. So thank you for that, uh, Tarek. Thank you so for that, Will. Why don't you just for this next session? I'm pleased that we've I'm very pleased that we've gathered not only some of the best thinkers on democracy, but some of Larry's closest friends and colleagues, and together they're going to tackle the current challenges to democracy and how Larry has contributed to the cause of democracy. Carl Gershman, come on up to the stage, our founding president of the endowment who built the house that we are in today. Carl, it's wonderful to have you here. Frank Fukuyama, uh, who is with us, the uh, Nomalini Senior Fellow at the Stanford University's uh, Spogli Institute, another intellectual activist well-known here who, like Larry, inspires so many of our partners, our grantees around the world, and a former recipient of NED's Democracy Service Medal. Frank, we're honored uh, uh, by that. Uh, Jima Boadi, the co-founder and co-chair of Afrobarometer, um, co-founder and former executive director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, a very close colleague of Larry, and one of the first grantees from Afrobarometer that I met when I started my job here. And we are going to be joined by, I think she is a just-in-time arrival from her flight. There she is. Yes, Alina. Welcome, Alina. It is terrific to have Alina Munju uh, Pipiti with us, professor of democracy studies at the Hurdy School of Governance in Berlin, a world-class anti-corruption expert who's had a just-in-time arrival. And with that, we're gonna turn it over to our vice president, the endowment's vice president for studies and analysis, Chris Walker, who has been behind this extraordinary research agenda that Larry mentioned around kleptocracy, sharper power. Over to you, Chris. And I think we're going to see a, a short video first, and then we'll uh, commence this session. And I'd like to welcome everyone back to our discussion. I think we can see from the uh, just wonderful discussions we've had so far what a remarkable person Larry Diamond is. And I've kept a, a short list of uh, some of the elements of Larry's exceptional multidimensional talent that have been mentioned. He's a scholar at the top of his field, an educator par excellence, a writer, an editor, an institutional leader, a mentor to so many people, an activist, and a public intellectual who arguably is playing a singular role in the debate today on the fate of democracy. And I think as uh, was so articulately uh, stated in the last discussion, at a time when the democracy narrative is under siege, Larry is making such a powerful public argument on behalf of democracy. Larry Diamond is the whole package. It's a fact. Um, and he's, of course, a wonderful person. I would call him a democracy renaissance person, given all the things he manages to do 24-7, uh, it seems. And so in this session, I'm just so pleased that we're going to have the chance to hear from four people who know Larry uh, very, very well, who have worked with him so closely, and they can speak to both his contributions to the cause of democracy, and we'll do that in the first part of our discussion, and then I'm hopeful we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about the challenges we face that have been so central to Larry's life's work. All of the people on the panel are remarkable in their own right, and I'm very pleased to turn first 
to NED's founding president, Carl Gershman. It was really my honor to work with and for Carl for so many years, like so many people in this room. And uh, why don't we start with you, Carl, if uh, you would say some words about Larry, his contribution to the cause of democracy, and then we'll turn to others on the panel. Thanks, Chris. And I, well, we saw it, we just saw it. I mean, uh, that was an amazing uh, off the cuff performance, Larry. <laughs> And uh, it shows why you've been so such an important part of this institution. Um, you know, with all the trouble we had at the beginning of the net, and we were fighting for our very survival, the, for some reason, I don't know why, but the stars were uh, properly aligned in, term, in, the, in the case of our relationship with you. Because uh, it started at the very, very beginning. Uh, Mark and I, Mark came on in September of 84, and we both wanted to have a research component of the NED, but we didn't have the buddy, we didn't have the staff, and the board was against it. <laughs> so we were sort of really stymied. And then, you know, in the very first year of our existence, a proposal comes across to Transom uh, we call it the Lipset Lids Diamond proposal to support a study of democracy in, of 26 countries uh, dem called Democracy in Developing Countries. And it wasn't that expensive. I won't say how much it was, but it, you know, as these things go, we had, we had the money to do it. And I think both Mark and I saw it as a way to get into this. You know, we had one member of the board, I won't say who it was, who said, this is going to be a do tank, not a think tank. Uh, as if thinking and ideas have no relationship to this whatsoever. But we made the grant. It produced the three volumes on Asia, Africa, Latin America. You still haven't done the introductory volume. <laughs> uh, but it started the relationship right at the beginning, right at the beginning, which was so, uh, which was so terrific. And one thing led to another. Um, you know, the International Forum, fellows, but of course, the crown jewel uh, was the journal, which was, you know, it was my way of sort of keeping Mark at Ned. But in addition to that, because he wanted to leave, and I said, oh, what do we create a journal? But, you know, in addition to that, from the very, very beginning, it was always going to be a partnership between you and him. Um, between somebody at the NED and somebody who was out there uh, at Stanford on the West Coast, somebody on the East Coast, uh, and then, you know, somebody who, like Mark, who had been a, a New York intellectual, um, a, a protege of uh, Irving Kristol, and you, uh, a political scientist uh, and a protege of Marty Lipset. I mean, it was just so perfectly balanced and everything that we've heard uh, today, you know, what Damon said and others, I mean, is that this was, it just, it, it, it was just uh, a marvelous, not, not only a marvelous addition to the NED, but when you think of, you know, the importance of ideas to democracy and values, uh, Bill Goldston this week reminded me of something, he has a great piece in, the, in American Purpose, it's a review, but he reminded me of a, um, of, of a speech that Lincoln gave and how he was uh, playing with a proverb. And the proverb uh, had something to do with a word fitly spoken is, a, is, is, like, uh, a, ap is like apples of gold uh, on, a, on, a fr on a setting of silver. Apples of gold on a setting of silver. And when you think about it, uh, you know, for Lincoln, the apples of gold was our Declaration of Independence. And those words in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created, all men and women, are created equal. And the, the setting of silver was the Constitution. And in a way, you can think of the democratic idea and the journal which represents that democratic idea as the apple of gold. Uh, for the net, and the, and the net itself being this uh, setting of silver. 
Um, and that's how it turned out. And, and the journal just became such a, a perfect centerpiece. Um, I mean, obviously, and this is something that you did as well. I mean, you were not just interested in the research dimension of the NED, because you, you know, in, in everything that we did, you took an equal interest in the world movement for democracy. And it's been said here many, many times, you know, you have uh, and have had over, you know, a, a deep, profound commitment to the activists that we bring together. So it was really both. And uh, as has been said, you know, you are one of a kind in, in the way you are both um, a, uh, uh, an, an activist um, and, uh, and somebody who is an analyst, uh, somebody who is committed to scholarship uh, as well as to activism, uh, somebody who uh, is, uh, you know, who elevates academic rigor as high as it can be elevated, but at the same time uh, is uh, committed, is, is, is passionate about democracy and is engaged. That's a very, very hard balance to strike uh, because, you know, I mean, what all of us have to avoid is being engaged in wishful thinking or in, in, in saying this is going to happen because we want it to happen. Uh, and, you know, you've really avoided that in a marvelous way, and you've found this uh, perfect balance. There are so many other things I could say about it, about you and, and your development at the NED over these years. I mean, one is, and I'll be very brief about this, but one is the way, you know, you've, you've broadened and grown. I mean, because you started out as an Africanist. Um, with the book on, you know, the, the First Republic, the failure of the First Republic in Nigeria. Um, but then you, you, you just expanded into all the regions of the world, scores every country, as we've seen here, every country uh, in the world. Uh, they, they, you, there were no limits to uh, your, your scholarship uh, and the way you were able to become a kind of a, a global democratic uh, democracy uh, specialist. And then, you know, you did that film with Ben Moses, um, A Whisper uh, to a Roar, uh, which, you know, again, built on five activists in five struggling countries. They were, you know, Zimbabwe, uh, Malaysia, Egypt was one, of, was one of the countries, Ukraine, and Venezuela. I think those were the five countries, uh, which, again, was just another dimension uh, of your work. And then as we've said here already, as the crisis in the U.S. started to deepen, and this was something that was of great concern to Juan Linz um, near his death, and I think he died in 2013, but he was, last four or five years of his life, he was very worried about the United States. And, you know, and you have, you know, you have uh, focused your attention increasingly uh, on, on the United States and what you've called, you know, this the death spiral of polarization and distrust and all the things that are happening in our country are not really getting any better. And we don't know how they're going to be affected by Ukraine. And even we've had these email exchanges over the past few, you know, few days. Things could be going better, but we could something terrible could happen in 20, 2024 in terms of the future of the country. I mean, we've got to uh, re reform this Electoral Count Act. Which will, but you've pointed out other risks that we face, but you've become a leading specialist on the problems that we have. And then maybe a last point, uh, in your article in, uh, in the January issue of the journal, you're really sort of you know, talking about the rise of Russia and China and the military threats. And you wrote this you know, the last year, really, the end of the last year, but the military threats that are faced by both Ukraine and Taiwan. And you just said, our community, which is really focused on politics uh, and, and civil society, uh, we have to begin to develop some understanding of the geopolitical and the military and this, you know, these broader strategic questions, which is very, very hard for our community. But again, it's part of your broadening, and you're always dealing with uh, you know, the critical issues. And you, I think the, the key to your importance as a democracy scholar is you've been comprehensive, You've been, you've integrated everything. You've been unsparingly uh, realistic uh, in your analysis. Uh, and, and I think that's what's made you um, really the national treasure uh, that you are. 
And what you stand for is now deeply embedded uh, in, into the identity of the National Endowment for Democracy. I mean, that's never going to change. Um, and uh, it's just been a, uh, you know, a blessing for the institution. And frankly, for me personally, our friendship, it's been a blessing for me. So thank you. And, and thank you so much, Carl. I think this idea of Larry being a national treasure is a great one. And it's something we should uh, continue to use. And you, you mentioned the scope of Larry's work over the years, but that he actually started by focusing on Africa. And so I wonder if we uh, can't turn to Jima Bwadi and have your reflections on Larry's contributions uh, to the cause from your perspective. Thank you. And again, great honor, great privilege to be part of this audience and to be in a room where a great Larry is being honored. Uh, but as many of you have said and will keep saying, Larry is without doubt a, if not the preeminent scholar of, uh, of the third wave democratizations and um, its processes, its triumphs, its, tra its travails, future, and so on. But, oh, sorry. I had to turn mine off. Okay. Great, thank you. So I was just uh, thanking all of you for the opportunity to be in this room and to be part of this great celebration of the great works of uh, Larry Diamond. And as many of you here would have said and will continue saying, Larry is without doubt the leading democracy scholar today. He's done it all. Uh, looked at the processes, looked at his triumphs, looked at his travails, and has been looking at his future trajectory. Uh, again, he's been singularly important in the study or coming up with a truly comparative study of democratization processes as a global phenomenon and also as a historical phenomenon. And most important from my vantage, and as has been alluded to, we in Africa truly have Larry to thank for bringing Africa into the study and understanding of democratization in a global historical context, beginning with his seminar work on the Nigeria's first republic and the causes of the, the collapse of that republic. But personally and up close, Larry has been a leader in the building and nurturing of formal and informal networks for advancing democracy and for countering authoritarianism in different regions of the world and in different countries. And I've been personally uh, a beneficiary of the, two of, the, of, of the two institutions that I've been involved in, in establishing and co-founding the Ghana Center for Democratic Development and also the Afrobarometer. First, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, uh, which we started in 1998 at a time in Ghana where we had a, a regime that was democratically elected but had come immediately from military authoritarian origins and so um, was having a difficult time coexisting with the structures of democratic constitution. And Larry came, our center had been newly formed. The government was full of suspicion of this baby possible CIA entity and so on. And uh, he spoke of, on, of all things about corruption, about political corruption, about institutional corruption. But he spoke to the issue so clearly, so powerfully that several years after he left, the way in which he spoke about, he diagnosed the problem the propositions he made about how to cure it framed the debate and discussions on that subject in that country for many years, and in some ways still continues to do so. Uh, second was the uh, formation of the Afrobarometer, of which I'm a co-founder, as indicated. Again, uh, we always thought of the Afrobarometer as part of the um, global barometers originally inspired by the Eurobarometer, but 
we were much more closely aligned with the Latino barometer and the New Asian barometer and so on. And Larry, of course, was one of our first set of international advisors. We've since gone corporate, and he's still a member of the International Advisory Council and uh, has been a bit of big help, especially in linking us to also funders. Funders in Silicon Valley at, in about 2016, 2017, when the Afrobarometer nearly suffered a financial collapse. Uh, we have still since bounced back, thanks largely to one of the connections that Larry made uh, for, for us in Silicon Valley, that is the Hewlett Foundation. So I think, so far as I'm concerned, both Center for Democratic Development and Afrobarometer would not have be where it is today and be playing the role it's playing nationally and continentally if we didn't have the great, great help and general support of Larry Diamond. So Larry, we're grateful to you. We are glad that you are being on it. I think I, I represent my colleagues in Ghana, at least when we say well-deserved, uh, please don't retire, do stay in touch and let's continue to work with you. Thank you. So, Jima, my strong suspicion is that Larry will never really retire. So it's my guess, just knowing his work ethic and um, how much he's involved in. So maybe now I'll turn to uh, Alina Munju Pippity. Uh, the outset, if you want to say some uh, remarks regarding your interaction with Larry, uh, his cause, his contribution to the cause, and then we'll turn to Frank Fukuyama. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And of course, uh, delighted to, to be here. I met Larry in, uh, in one of the typical circumstances. We started talking with one another without very well knowing who one another was and this big gathering about freedom of information. And do you think that this is something which may be the trick to, to set a society in motion, to, to, to uh, push a bit a bit? There was a, little, a lot of democratization, you know, at the time. But in the same time, we also felt quite stuck in, in, in the process. And he was, you know, contagiously enthusiastic, sending this flow of energy. And he said, if you started to do that, that's the best thing to do. Do it and continue to do it. Do it across borders. Do it to our others and come back to me and report to me how it worked. <laughs> and it's so, so, you know, it was not at all an academic endeavor, although this was a scientific conference, OK? And I, afterwards, I told myself, you know, how, God, how smart I was that I was in a room with Larry Diamond, whom I didn't even know very well who he was. I knew he was you know, a top figure in them. And luckily, instead of discussing regressions with him and other things, we really discuss like, what is the most practical thing to do in societies which are really stuck, which have all the institutions, all the form. So really, you know, further on, when we became more engaged in, in academic topics, I realized that this was because I was a witness, I've seen this happening. This was the greatest contribution of Larry Diamond in an extremely formalized study which took for granted the fact that if you adopt the formal institutions of a democracy, you should have a democracy and you should study a democracy just by these formal constitutional arrangements. Larry is the first to push further from the notion of consolidation of democracy into the quality of democracy, asking the substantial question why you know, uh, are we having such a fantastic success? Why, to cite Frank here, we have really won at the big game of history. Now we had an unprecedented number of democracies. However, most of these democracies, many of them, most is too much to say, were hollow democracies. And therefore, we definitely had to go on this formal framework that we had, the de facto institution, the de jure institutions that we have, into the de facto, into the nitty gritty, into the societies, into what goes on into the societies which adopt all the constitutional forms, which hold regular elections. Apparently, they have free media, but you know they're really not, not as what we would expect of democracies. And this was his big project of quality and democracy. And again, I meet with Jima a lot here. The extraordinary effect for us was that somebody finally mentioned the word corruption and understood that this difference between formal and informal institution is 
which was huge in many of these societies, a gap that the name of this gap is governance and that corruption is a big part of it. And this is what we should study if we are indeed to deepen this process and not just to, you know, anytime I go to a, any gathering, I'm always uh, feel overshadowed by some uh, French educated lawyer from some African country who is definitely a far better Democrat than me because he speaks absolutely all the terms in the catalog. They must give a great edu education in French law schools. You know? But in the same time, if you look at the human record of his countries compared to the countries where I worked on as, a, as an activist, now as a professor, you see that all this extraordinary group of lawyers have not managed in 30 years or in 40 years to bridging the real country and the legal country a bit. And I think that this new generation, us, if I may say so, this new generation of, of scholars who in the same time are activists and who went after the real thing, also academically thinking, how can we study this? How can we study this in order to be accepted academically, not to be considered journalists, not to be considered activists, to be able to go to the biggest publishers and say, you know what, I really want to study this. I really don't care for anything else because nothing else is important. We need to study things which, which matter. Okay, so I've seen all this time span from the biggest success when everybody seemed a democracy to now when a few less people seem to be to have democracies, but in the same time, I've seen how our tools develop. So I don't think that we are a failure. Right now, I'm at the end of two years when I finished uh, for the first time, we have an assessment of transparency around the world. I mean, you may believe that many of them exist, but they don't. We generally consider that if countries have freedom of information, as we promote it in our lives, that's the end of the story. But you know, today everybody has freedom of information, but there's a big gap between having freedom of information legislation and real transparency. So we did for the first time a measurement of transparency, looking at 20 different websites in 130 countries. It's been online now for 10 days, so please go there and, uh, and, and check it. It's on corruptionrisk.org slash transparency. And looking at this, I realized that there has been tremendous progress in the past 25 years. None of this existed, none of this. And even donors who are only working with government, like donors in my own country, current country, yeah, right, the Gs, they were only working with government. Now they timidly start to understand that they have to build foundations for the society to be stronger and defend itself for abuse for power. They're funding land cadasters. They're funding any forms of registrations of property. They really fund things which matter for people, which empower people to resist the abuse of power because we're talking about societies where people are practically powerless, so they haven't come to lips at one. You know, they cannot graduate from there because they're not here first in, in, in the first stage. And all this happened in this 20, 25 years due to the fact that we promoted transparency so much. It's not hollow. I see this feeling filling in. And then if you calculate continent by continent, if you put together the, uh, the capacity of civil society, what I call e-citizenship, the digital citizens, the people armed with a smartphone where they have internet, if you interact this with transparency, there you see that it is happening. It is happening. What we need to do, of course, is more, more investment, more money, we still have very poor people. But it's not that we're not going anywhere. The world grows. You see, if you look across the time, this bad political trends. Yes, freedom of the press has been bad the past 15 years. Yes, judicial independence is not going up. It's not declining, but it's not going up. But there are lines which only go up. This is the line of e-citizenship goes up absolutely everywhere. A line of e-government services, which also reduce abuse of government, also going up. So, you know, there are elements of natural progress which come due to technology and the kind of times that we live. And scholars who built this temple to transparency and who encouraged both activists and scholars to rally along this, this kind of flag, I think they're going to have quite a lot of, uh, you know, of satisfaction in the future, not just disillusionment due to the things that were discussed in the second part of this panel when we're going to be more pessimistic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alina, for that. One thing you said caught my ear was that Larry knows how to focus on the things that matter. And I think for a scholar at the top of his field who could, at least in principle, be pulled into uh, more esoteric and less central sorts of things, Larry always has a focus on what matters. And I think that's a um, terribly important part of his uh, being and his success in this 
uh, important work we do. And with that, let me turn to Frank Fukuyama now. Okay, thanks, Chris. So I thought uh, I talk uh, from the perspective of, of an academic colleague of Larry's. My office is only two doors down from his in Encino Hall. He helped bring me to Stanford 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think um, I've gotten to know him uh, on a personal basis pretty well in that period. Um, for example, I know all about his dog, Rosie. So apparently, <laughs> Rosie, uh, when he got his copy of my new book, immediately growled and sunk her teeth into it and chewed up the cover because she apparently is not a liberal and <laughs> does not like uh, the defense of liberalism. The other uh, experience I would say that probably a lot of people in this room have had, so there are certain things in Larry's life that have been constant throughout you know, uh, his life. Uh, so one of them is democracy. He was, a, he was an activist as an undergraduate at Stanford, uh, a student leader, and you know, with every passing year, he's, uh, he's supported uh, democracy. The other thing that's constant is the following. You meet Larry uh, coming into the office, and you say, Larry, how's things going? Then there's a big sigh, <laughs> and he says, oh, I'm exhausted. I only got four hours sleep last night. <laughs> and you think that this is a really crisis situation because Larry is, is you know, has worked himself, uh, you know, uh, uh, to such a point that he's about to collapse. But this happens, you know, year in, year out, uh, and it doesn't matter what job he's doing. So stepping down from the Journal of Democracy, which is a huge job, you know, you have to read lots of manuscripts and do lots of editing and call on a lot of people and so forth. If you think that Larry's going to stop complaining about how little sleep he got, it's not going to happen. Uh, I guarantee that it's going to continue for some time. So the first thing I want to say is uh, a little bit about Larry as a teacher. In 2006, I believe, uh, he won the Dinkelspiel Award, which is an annual award that Stanford gives out to its best teachers. Uh, he has been uh, the mentor of generations of Stanford uh, undergraduates over the years. So I just want to read a list of some of his uh, students uh, that you might recognize. One of them is Cory Booker, currently senator from New Jersey. Uh, Lena Hidalgo is the judge of Harris County, which is the city of Houston, the 11th largest. She, got, she was elected to this when she was 28 years old or something. Uh, Jared Cohen is the head of Google Ideas. Uh, Rebecca Bill Chavez is the president of the Inter-American Dialogue. Melinda Herring uh, is deputy director of the Atlantic Council's U uh, Eurasia Center, very active uh, uh, currently on Ukraine. Gary Rosen is the editor of the Wall Street Journal uh, Saturday Review section. Hisham uh, Alawi is a leading analyst and advocate for democratic change in the Arab world. Uh, Sebastian Berduja is a founding partner of PACT uh, for Romania, civic and political movement for freedom, citizen engagement, and rule of law. Mai El Sadani is managing director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Jawar Mohammed uh, is a leading Oromo dissident and polit uh, politician in Ethiopia. And Aaron Jen is a professor of international relations at the Central European University. This list could go on and on and on, but I think it indicates uh, the quality of the students, but also the quality of the teaching that each one of these individuals received and the mentorship, because Larry doesn't just teach in class. He develops these deep relationships with his students that continues long after they've uh, graduated. And so... I think for an academic, that's you know, probably one of the biggest ways that you actually shape the world. And so, Larry, you've done a terrific job. Second thing I just want to talk about is the Journal of Democracy. So I'm a political scientist, but I would say that academic political science uh, is pretty much a wasteland in a lot of ways. If you open up the American Political Science Review, it's hard for a normal person to actually read one of the articles in it. You know, it's really hard because... I mean, at one point they just had regression tables. Now they're reporting on, you know, randomized ex uh, controlled experiments. But it's extremely methodological. And 
you know, that constitute, and, and there's obviously an important role for methodology, but uh, it really constitutes a barrier to ordinary people being able to actually read this literature, understand it, and profit from it. And I would say that the Journal of Democracy that um, uh, Tarek and Will have now uh, inherited is, you know, a beacon of hope in this, in this, uh, uh, in this rather difficult terrain uh, because it's a readable and very informative uh, journal that's had a huge impact uh, in actual real-world uh, debates. And so just, you know, a couple of the articles that have been published in that journal over the last uh, 30 years, Perils of Presidentialism by Juan Lin set off this huge debate over presidential versus parliamentary systems, the transition paradigm by Tom Carruthers talked about whether we weren't deceiving ourselves in, you know, in the 90s, thinking that everything was transitioning to democracy. Bowling Alone by Bob Putnam became, you know, a kind of icon of uh, uh, fragmenting uh, civil society. The debate between uh, Don Horowitz and Aaron Lippard on consociational democracy also is kind of standard fare for people who are trying to figure out how to organize Democracies, And again, that list, like his list of students, could go on and on because that journal, I think, has played a, a, you know, a, a really critical role in pointing to what are the big issues in institutional design, democratic transition, uh, de-democratic transition, unfortunately, in recent years, uh, and the like. And um, it's certainly been, um, uh, for me, one of the best resources both in understanding what's going on in the world and also as a teaching tool because if you look at my syllabus when I teach a basic comparative politics course, you know, half of the uh, readings are from a Diamond and Plattner edited volume of which, how many are there now? 30. 30, yeah, okay, lots of them, <laughs> lots and lots of them. Uh, so it's a great achievement. Larry, you did a, a great job. You and Mark, you know, created a great, um, uh, institution and congratulations on all of that. So I think we've gotten a sense of these amazing achievements and contributions that Larry has made. Now it will take a moment to turn to some of the issues we're confronting that Larry has spoken to through his writings, through his speaking, uh, in so many ways to hear from our panelists their thoughts on what we might do, perhaps drawing on some of Larry's wisdom to meet these evidently significant challenges for democracy that have uh, come upon us in recent years. So let me turn first to Carl, and then we'll make our way through and um, continue the discussion. I'll be, yes. Yeah. I'll be very brief, um, but Frank, you know, there's also Larry's article in the January issue of the, of the journal, Democracy's Clear and Present Danger, which has obviously now been overtaken by events, but it's still going to be uh, the centerpiece of the uh, Forum 2000 conference, its next uh, conference, which I hope uh, Larry will address. You know, the changes that are, we're going through are just enormous, and Larry has called it a hinge, a hinge of history. Um, and Winston Churchill once, once said of uh, Finland that it's the service that it has rendered to, uh, to mankind is magnificent, and obviously that's what we can all say today about Ukraine. The service to mankind is magnificent, and it's brought about an entirely new, uh, a new situation. So as we look to the immediate future, and Larry gave a brilliant talk uh, at Stanford in the middle of uh, April about this, where he talked about the new era that we're in uh, after it was looking so utterly, uh, utterly bleak, and even now he's talking about a possible fourth wave. But I think this has to begin with Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine must win this war. Uh, the international community must help Ukraine rebuild, and Ukraine must be brought into the European Union. Um, and this is a, a long and difficult process, I know, with a lot of obstacles standing in the way. But all of this is possible, and it should be done. But in addition to that, I mean, just the region that Ukraine is in is a region now of you know, of opportunity. Um, uh, Svetlana Chikhanovskaya um, uh, just, uh, uh, just said that uh, the, the toughest sanction that could be issued against um, 
Russia today would be a democratic and free Belarus. And that becomes possible now as well. And then finally, uh, as we think about this, I mean, there's Russia itself, uh, which is going to have to go through a profound change. And, you know, what you don't want as we go through this is, is a defeated and humiliated Russia, uh, where the democracy that conceivably could come to, uh, to Russia after this will be a Weimar democracy uh, to be succeeded by resentful people. Uh, that's going to be very, very difficult. But we have to remember that there, first of all, are people like Vladimir Karamurza in prison now in Russia, and he speaks for a lot of people, and, and of course, uh, Navalny. And they could, they are an alternative for Russia, but we've obviously uh, got to behave and act in a way, and they have to behave and act in a way that brings the Russian people along after what is going to be just a, a, a traumatic uh, period for them. So that's where it begins. And I think that region has the possibility for a renaissance, um, and that should be at the top of our priorities. Now, obviously, uh, the whole world, uh, we, have, we cannot lose sight of anything. We, can, we obviously cannot lose sight of Burma. We cannot lose sight of Africa, which has not you know, joined the West. Even they, Putin has a lot of friends in Africa. But still, if the, if the global zeitgeist changes, as Larry has said, or this uh, Zeitenwende that uh, Olaf uh, Schultz has talked about, the turning of an, of an era, if that happens, it will affect countries everywhere. Uh, and this is uh, something that we, that, we have to, uh, that we have to take advantage of and maybe end the uh, decline and, of, and the recession of democracy that Larry really coined that term. And, and see if it's not possible uh, to, uh, you know, to start a new wave of democratization. But so much depends upon what happens here. And you know, it's hard to be hopeful. It's hard to be hopeful. But still, uh, we have to, and, uh, and we have to think hard about this. Finally, I just want to make one other point of something that I think is possible and important in the period ahead, and that's Cuba. Um, July 22nd marks the 10th anniversary of the murder of the, uh, of the Václav Havel, the Andrei Sakharov, the Nelson Mandela of Cuba, uh, Osvaldo Paya. There's going to be an important book coming out, a biography by David Hoffman uh, of Osvaldo Paya next month uh, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary. I was at an event last week on Paya. And I can't be, and it was on the hill. I can't begin to tell you how many times Russia was mentioned as the backbone, uh, how much Cuba is supporting Russia, and how Russia is the backbone of the Cuban dictatorship. The world is changing. Uh, the Cuban regime is in a disastrous state economically. Uh, I mean, the protests that happened last July 11th, uh, with the result of the fact that people have no food, no medicine. Uh, it's it's just a catastrophe, the country is a catastrophe. And we have to help make that change happen. I mean, obviously it's the Cuban people that have to do this, but there's an opportunity there. And if you could get a democratic change in Cuba, which obviously we thought might happen in, in 1989, 1990, but it didn't. But now it's possible and there is a mass, really a grassroots movement with the San, you know, the San Isidro movement, artists, Afro-Cubans and so many others. If that could happen, I think it would ha make an enormous change uh, on democracy globally because Cuba has played such a, a global role in democracy. So Carl alluded to the um, centrality of what's happening in Ukraine, the horrors that are happening there, but also the opportunities that may emerge really 30 years after the end of the collapse of the Soviet Union, shaking the region politically and in security terms. But I wonder, Carl, if there aren't um, multiple zeitgeists now, and perhaps I turn to Jima just for his reflections on how you see these developments from your perspective, um, changing the prospects for democracy. Do you see promise coming from developments or more turmoil or um, instability? <clears throat> Great. I mean, first to acknowledge that like many regions of, of the world, there is definitely uh, a backsliding on democracy in, in Africa as well. And unfortunately, uh, the backsliding is being experienced um, in countries that 
a few years ago were considered as star, de star democracies on the continent. South Africa, uh, Ghana, Senegal, uh, Benin, and so on. So there, there, some of that is very true. But I think it's, it's very important to underscore something that we know from 20 years or so, two decades of Afrobarometer surveys across the continent, that in Africa, the problem and the challenge of democracy is largely a supply side problem and not yet a demand side problem. In that pair, findings of Afrobarometer surveys, at least in 30 countries for which we have um, over time data, you are talking of very strong and continuing popular subscription to the norms and institutions of democracy. Um, there are, of course, you know, some country variations and, uh, and so on, but by and large, that has remained fairly stable and even increased across some indicators. So if you take an indicator like the degree to which people prefer, say they prefer a government that is accountable, even if it's not so strong on effectiveness, versus a government that is effective but not, an, not accountable. Between 2011 and 2021, roughly, you are talking of a 12 percentage point increase in subscription to accountable governance over one that is not accountable, even if it's effective. You are talking of very strong and high levels of commitment to the idea of presidential tenure being limited to two terms. You are talking of growing commitment to the idea of multi-party democracy as opposed to single party. Um, military rule continues to be rejected and so on. So that those have held fa fairly steady. I, I must admit though that there are also some countries where there's been a very steep decline in support for democratic ideals and norms. One that is disturbing for me is South Africa, where in the last round of the survey, 2019, 2021, only 44% of adult South Africans say they support democracy, and they prefer it to any other form of government. And in the same country too, rejection of military rule is dropping. Uh, currently in Burkina Faso, the idea of um, Military rule is fairly, it's a majority opinion, and um, only a minority think it's a bad idea. So that there, is, there are some problems there. But when you take everything together, the degree to which people say they support democracy and reject authoritarian alternatives of government versus the degree to which they think their governments are de delivering democracy or the degree to which they rate themselves are satisfied with the way democracy works in their country, then there is a gap. And that continues to be the case on the average and for a majority of countries. So I end up by saying it is very much a supply problem. And because it's a supply problem, you also now have to look at what is going on at the level of the people, at the level of civil society, at the level of citizens. And here I get I feel a lot more hopeful because in Africa, at least, in the last few years, you see, um, if you take South Africa, for instance, and the opposition to the gross Zuma administration, it was largely the courts, state institution, but one which had its sufficiently brave jurists and others who stood up to to Zuma and said, you know, we, we're going to, you can't fire your chief prosecutor, you can't do this or that. Uh, so there is definitely hope there. Even more so and more recently, if you look at the developments in Nigeria uh, over the course of about three weeks or so, when um, mainly young citizens in Lagos and other regional capitals mounted street protest against what they, what they saw as gross abuse of power, gross abuse of duties by their uh, so-called um, uh, special 
uh, secret, special protection, SARS. SARS is an agency that had been set up basically to combat robberies and so on, and SARS became predatory on society, engaged in extortion and so on, and citizens have been protesting for a while, getting no attention from government. Or one day they decided that, no, we've had too much, and they basically stood up to the government. Um, they, several got massacred, several got maimed, but in the end they got the government to back down, disband the organization, and most importantly, to ad admit that a massacre of unarmed citizens had taken place. Something which had been strenuously de denied by the information minister who quipped that if there had been any killings at the Lekki uh, tow, 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 tow booth, then it would be the first instance in history where there had been a massacre without blood or bodies. But a few months later, he was forced to admit that there had been indeed massacre and that uh, some action should be taken against those who committed that crime against humanity. So if nothing at all, there are these brave Africans on the street who are on a daily basis challenging government authoritarianism and pushing back on autocratization. And I see hope coming from there. Thank you so much, Dima. You've described how, on the one hand, there is this unrelenting uh, demand for democracy and the supply is weak. At the same time, the struggles of achieving more accountable governance persist in many respects. Well, maybe I'll take this oppor opportunity as we slowly bring this discussion to a uh, conclusion to turn to Alina, just to say a word or two about top order challenges you see and how we might better meet them in the struggle to improve um, the challenge of accountable governance. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll start with Ukraine as well, because of course I'm an East European and uh, I, I care for, for that region, but I'll just use Ukraine to make a, a little bit of a, of a bigger point. So this war in Ukraine, I think was avoidable. And I don't think we discuss about this at all. This war should not have happened. And now that this war has happened, we are discussing, so it's not a new war, it's a part of an old war, a war that we had not finished, right, at the end of the, of the Cold World War. And we are now in the situation, are we now in a better situation to finish this war? I think that this is the essential question, which is a concern to me, who, like Larry, had family who uh, was mostly in Siberia and Kazakhstan deported since we didn't run as far as, as UK as they did. So um, I think that this is a war with, uh, with Russia. I think that it happens to be in Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine was the most vulnerable point. And I don't think it's a new war. I don't think the, the solution to this war is clear to me. Uh, we cannot finish off Russia. I don't think that anybody is unrealistic enough to say that Russia can be extinguished, right? And therefore this, which would have been a clear possibility, is out, right? What is the other plan? Can we cut Russia in two the way we did with Germany, for instance? I mean, is there another plan of that sort? Or whatever happens at the end of it, we would still have the same problem that we had uh, in the years 2000s when I was filming as part of the EU policy project, I was filming all this abandoned missile places of Russia. I have this, uh, it's on YouTube, the film. It's called Where Europe Ends, and you can see all the former Russia missile places with greenery and sheep uh, feeding themselves around in all, this, all these deserted places, and the nuclear submarine underground port in Balaklave in Crimea was turned into a museum by Ukrainians, and I visited it. By the way, I was the only visitor buying a ticket with three grivna. And at the time, so I'm talking 2003 or 2004, at the time, the Black Sea was completely, completely denuclearized. There was absolutely, Russia was in complete retreat, right? And if we wanted to do something to prevent them to become a, a strong force, we should have done it then, right? Not now when we're years later and the cost seems to be, to be very great. So I don't see honestly the plan here, and I'm completely scared if I am told that the plan A, B, and C is democratization of Russia. 
It's not that I don't want Russia to be democratic and I do not want as many democratic friends. You know, I have lots of Democrats friends in Russia, but that's really not a plan. Remember that Tocqueville, whom we all cherish in this room and where we had many seminars about him, was ending his second book of democracy in America saying that there are two nations of earth seem to whom the 20th century and after seem reserved simply due to the fact that they are so populous and they have these huge territories and resources. And the two nations are US and Russia. So we really had, since this Tocqueville prediction, we had over 150 years to think what to do with Russia if one of these two nations happens not to be a democracy. And this regardless of regime, the other thing which scares me is to see all this personalization around Putin. Putin obviously is a very bad person, but I think it's really childish to just project all this like uh, like it's Lord of the Rings and he is Sauron and we're gonna come and you know, and in order to defeat Sauron, are we in Lord of the Rings? I think not because we run for Erdogan and Aliyev and other not so nice guys to help us build the energy front in Putin. And this is the same short termism that we also used when we contributed involuntarily to building all this Islamic war, which is also not a new war, right? I mean, we're fighting in Africa exactly the same war that General Gordon was fighting. And at the time, there was a clear two points of view in the West that we should indeed defend the local population from this bad guy, the Islamists, and that we should not, because they're different civilization and the West should not mix. All this super debate exists in the British Parliament. You know, you can read it. I mean, we're talking old wars, old wars which we have not finished and in which our very new democracy promotion gets mingled in this planetary world, is it in our interest to have them mingled? Or can we somehow separate? I mean, now speaking a little bit more like you, the humility of a scholar, I'm an academic, I'm, I'm nothing else. And Larry, despite being extraordinarily influential, still he is an academic and somebody who inspires activists. I wish Larry would inspire, you know, heads of states, but I'm not so sure, but for sure, Activists he does inspire and civil society people and the rest. So I see this positive thing that I told to you about this gradual empowerment given by, by technology, but I also see the fact that all these are old words that we never really finished because we never really had a solution. And now I think with Russia we have a solution less than we ever had because before you could at least talk to them and conceive something with them. Now how can you talk with the terrorist who after threatening you that he's gonna kill half the room, we already killed the first 10 people. Now he's a criminal, it becomes far more difficult to kill. But can you take him off entirely? No, you cannot. So what is the situation of Europe? I mean, it's easier from United States, but for us it's very complicated. So the situation of Europe now is that all these places that I filmed where it was greenery, we're going to have to arm them again, and Europe is just going to be someplace opposed to Russia. This is what Europe, Europe is not ready for this role, even if Germany is now arming or whatever they're doing. We're really not good at this, and it's not a future. That's just not a future. So, but also I think these are, you know, grand questions which may not be so connected to what we do. What our role think it is, is in fostering collective society, collective, uh, action in each society, because Larry also remarked in one of his work, why do only smaller countries seem to have a, an easier job at consolidating their democracies? Smaller, less populous countries. Well, of course, you know, it's easier, it's easier to get together when you don't have complicated society, ethnically group, religiously group, and something like this. But then, you know, we have India. And that's, I'd like to end with, with a slight point. Maybe we should also conceive that we will still see progress in democracy, but it's not gonna be exactly the democracy infused with Western values. For us as East Europeans, who always aspire to be Europeans and part of the West and ferociously pro-Americans, you know, I applauded all the Americans' words. Now I'm really sorry for it, but I really applauded it. It's a trail of, a paper trail in, pub, in print of, of my approval for all this. But maybe the future is, is a bit different. India may still be a democracy, but they will not expose exactly the Western liberal values that we have. Still, we should not lose 
India, you know, really speaking and with all this landscape, we, it would be really criminal for ourselves, you know, if, if we lose them. So I think we should learn a lot from what happened. And I have not seen enough lessons learned and enough simply discussions of could we have done things differently? Because it's not true it's too late to think this way. I think one reason why we didn't progress is that we never discuss a little bit enough when was the moment when we should have acted differently, the turning point, uh, not to arrive in the point where we are for the future, not for the past. I think we should have this, this kind of conversations. And for us in our democracy promotion, we should simply think, is it in our advantage to be so completely tied in this geopolitical conflicts, or can we make our cause a little bit of a more neutral and, and separate cause in order to advance it? So thank you, Alina. One point that you made on Russia that I think is worth emphasizing that was, I think, channeled by Carl via uh, Larry's work in writing is that we really shouldn't engage in wishful thinking about um, what we confront vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and that any struggle will be a long-term one to have better outcomes there, both for the Russian people and for the countries uh, in Russia's neighborhood, which have tended to suffer so much over the years. So let me turn to... Um, Frank Fukuyama, uh, when Frank is done uh, speaking, we'll then move to our next uh, segment of the um, event, which will be uh, giving Larry the Democracy Service Medal. But Frank, please um, share with us in whatever way you think is appropriate how we should be thinking and focusing, uh, looking forward on some of these challenges we have. Uh, well, the one, is this on? Yeah. The one um, issue that I know Larry is very focused on right now uh, has been alluded to by a couple people already, and that's the United States. Uh, because if I think about the next few years, among the biggest threats to democracy may actually be the one in our country. I think 10 years ago, none of us would have imagined that something like this could be uh, possible. But, uh, you know, you have now a situation where, uh, you know, the, the January 6th uh, committee in Congress has been doing its homework. It's now revealed that that event was not a spontaneous uh, rally that just got out of hand somehow, that it, it had been carefully planned ahead of time, that there was a strategy for getting the vice president to declare that the electoral count in several states was wrong and therefore to accept a different slate and therefore to uh, keep uh, Mr. Trump in office. And in a way, uh, that's really bad because I, I can't really think of a case in American history where you've had a, you know, a president that was willing to overturn a democratic election so so um, overtly. But in a way, what's worse is the fact that, you know, a large part of the country has normalized this and thinks that, well, yeah, it's not the most important thing going on, and you know, the degree of partisanship has gotten so severe that, uh, you know, they're not willing to recognize this pretty obvious threat to democracy. So if you play out the scenario in 2024, there's a close election, uh, there's actually a breakdown of the process, um, there's violence uh, that could at, at that point come from either side, uh, and there's actually no agreement in the United States who is the legitimate uh, president, how's that gonna look in terms of global democracy? Not good. Uh, and so I think that part of the task that we've got uh, is to actually try to fix uh, our democracy before we can, well, I mean, I, I, not before. We have to do all of these things simultaneously, but it's very hard to see how we're going to have any credibility uh, projecting democratic values abroad if this kind of thing uh, is going on in our country. I know Larry has a lot of specific institutional suggestions. He's a big fan of ranked choice voting and you know, other uh, changes that could reduce the degree of uh, polarization in the United States. But I do think it's pretty, uh, you know, and then things like fixing the Electoral Count Act uh, uh, and so forth. I hope all of that happens because it is gonna be pretty important for the fate of democracy uh, here and thus in the rest of the world. So I think this entire conversation has spoken to the uh, global challenges we face in every conceivable quarter. I think it also speaks to the profound contribution 
that Larry Diamond has made in so many ways. It's almost innumerable, uh, ranging from his mentorship of students, the academic scholarly realm, activists. Um, to the mentorship of us. May I 20 it, seconds intercept? Maybe 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Just forgot to say one important thing about, about Larry, right? Larry is tall. He's one of these people who has a strong build and is tall and strong and gives this feeling of energy. And we know when people are like this, people around them tend to feel like lower a little bit, you know, because you cannot, you cannot much. So I really want to thank Larry on behalf of myself and I think of everyone else, of my friends and colleagues and all his old people who followed him, that he made all of us feel as tall as him. And he never realized what an extraordinary gift that is and how few people do it. Thank you. So I'm not going to be able to beat that conclusion. So I'm just going to thank Carl, Jima, Frank, and Alina. And thanks to all of you. Good enough. For those who know Larry, uh, Larry is not just a great scholar of democracy. Larry is a great human being. In my own experience, Larry has been instrumental in helping me grow intellectually and also professionally. It's very hard to walk around the world in this field and not meet people who owe something to Larry as a mentor, uh, a friend. Many of us already know Larry as a preeminent scholar of the third wave democratization process. And we know, of course, that he's done more than anybody else to build and nurture a global network of democracy scholars and activists. Larry's deep humanity and love of life shapes his work. And what Larry Diamond says at the end of the day is that we each sing single person individually hold a threat that makes the fabric of democracy in our country and worldwide. And he, he's also in a kind of a league of his own because he knows how to be hopeful when he's pessimistic and he knows how to be thoughtful when he's optimistic. And I do believe this is also a combination that many political activists lack. Just want to say how much I really appreciate all that Larry Diamond has done, not only for the field, uh, for democratic activism and human rights worldwide over his entire career, but for me personally and for the Citizen Lab. Larry helped Ned shape Ned's identity, an institution committed to the support of brave frontline democracy activists around the world. His spirit of democracy is embedded in Ned's heart and soul. I've been blessed by his friendship. Yes, it's in Ned's heart and soul. Alina, you said that Larry inspired activists, but perhaps not leaders. But I just I just was speaking with President Elvis of Estonia, who is up in Tallinn watching this mm -hmm. as a leader who has been inspired by Larry. We have them here. And what underscores from the conversation that we just heard, that Larry is really about relationships, whether with the students, as Frank pointed out, leaders, activists around the world, or the community here at the endowment. And that's what the endowment is about. Ken and I talk about this a lot, that the endowment is about people, not projects. It's about long-term relationships, trust, and that's what Larry represents. So Ned awards the Democracy Service Medal to true heroes of democracy. Its inscription says, for service and the cause of democracy, and it was first awarded to Polish president and founder of the Solidarity Trade Union Movement, Lech Walesa, and former AFL-CIO president, Lang Kirkland, in 1999. Previous recipients have included Senator John McCain, Mustafa Jamiliev of Crimea, Secretary Madeleine Albright, the Dalai Lama of Tibet, Frank Fukuyama, Tom Lantos, Václav Havel, Jan Novak, and your mentor, Seymour Martin Lipset. So tonight, we are pleased to award this medal to Larry Diamond for his lifelong commitment and his service to democracy. His longtime friend, colleague, co-editor, whose name has been invoked a lot tonight, Mark Platner, will offer a tribute to Larry 
and then we'll invite our extraordinary chairman, Ken Wallach, to join to present the medal. So Mark, please, the podium's yours. Well, I'm deeply grateful to have this opportunity to praise my longtime friend and co-editor, Larry Diamond. I'm not deeply grateful to be the last one to speak tonight. Um, it's been a remarkable set of discussions, and uh, I think uh, it really has captured much of what uh, makes Larry so uh, distinctive. And maybe I can add a little bit to it, but please forgive me if, if I wind up repeating some. So this is a wonderful, if bittersweet occasion. Um, celebrating Larry's retirement after more than 32 years as co-editor of the Journal of Democracy, the magazine that he and I founded in 1989. And um, you all uh, heard uh, his successor, Tarek Massoud, speak earlier today so you know that the journal remains in good hands, but I must admit that Tarek has a very tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, without Larry, the journal would never have become the outstanding publication that I believe it's now widely recognized to be. Uh, Larry's appointment as co-editor brought three enormous advantages to the journal. First, his very deep knowledge of comparative democracy, which was on display again here tonight. Second, his extraordinary gifts as an editor, uh, perhaps less well known, I'll say a word about that later. And third, his growing prestige as a scholar. At the 1990 reception that launched the first issue of the journal, uh, I recall that I introduced Larry as the world's leading younger scholar of democracy. Uh, Larry was too modest to accept that designation, but at the time I felt it was absolutely accurate. Today, of course, would no longer be appropriate to characterize Larry <laughs> as a younger scholar, <laughs> but I'm prepared to update that three decades old description to say that Larry is now the world's leading scholar of democracy to Kaur. This was something that, that Jima suggested as well. One hesitates, hesitates to make such a claim because of the shadow still cast by the eminent students of comparative democracy in the second half of the 20th century. Such towering figures in the world of political science as Seymour Morton Lipset. Samuel Huntington, Juan Lintz, and Guillermo O'Donnell, all of whom, by the way, were members of the journal's editorial board. But with most of the great democracy scholars of that earlier generation having now passed from the scene, I would say that Larry today stands unsurpassed in the breadth and depth of his scholarship on democracy. As Carl recounted to you, Larry's involvement with NED, his first involvement came as a grantee for a research project with Marty and Juan Lintz on democracy in developing countries. And it was at Stanford in 1985 at a conference of authors held at an early stage of that project that I first met Larry. It was, as Rick says to Louis at the end of Casablanca, beginning of a beautiful friendship. Through his connection with Ned, Larry became increasingly in interested in the practical challenges of democracy pro promotion. And he and Carl also got to know each other well, and we invited him, Larry that is, to address a number of Ned's internal meetings and public events. So when Carl and I began in 1988 to prepare an earnest for the launching of the journal, Larry was the obvious choice to be the new publication's co-editor. But his influence on Ned was far from limited to his work on the journal. He also became an informal advisor to Ned 
on a whole range of issues, played a key role in setting up the International Forum for Democratic Studies in 1994, uh, where he and I served for many years as its co-directors. He's been especially engaged, as I think someone mentioned, with Ned's Reagan Fussell Fellowship Program, devoting remarkable amounts of his time to reading and evaluating applications and to speaking to the current fellows when he visits Washington. And he also was instrumental in launching Stanford's Draper Hill Summer Fellowship Program, along with Frank, um, and in developing close and fruitful ties between Stanford's program and NEDS. During all these years, Larry remained based in Palo Alto as a fellow of the Hoover Institution and later as director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford's Freeman Spoley Institute for International Studies. Moreover, as you heard, he was an exceedingly popular teacher. Uh, he also took on all kinds of other assignments at Stanford. Uh, how he managed all this while devoting so much time to Ned and the Journal, not to mention writing so many important articles and books, is beyond my comprehension. Larry is remarkable for his energy and his indefatigability. That never stopped him, however, from co constantly complaining, as Frank indicated, <laughs> uh, uh, about uh, how overworked he was. His typical opening remark in our phone conversations would be, I've never been as overwhelmed as I am now. <laughs> in fact, on an occasion when the Ned staff prepared a mock cover of the journal, it featured an article by Larry Diamond entitled, I'm Totally Swamped. <laughs> <laughs> Yet all his other obligations never prevented him from accepting innumerable invitations to travel to literally every part of the world to attend academic meetings or to meet uh, with activists engaged in struggles for democracy in particular countries. I wish I had even a tiny percentage of his frequent flyer miles. For more than three decades, Larry closely traced the progress and then the regress of democracy throughout the world. While basing his analyses on such standard indicators as Freedom House's annual survey of freedom in the world, he used these data in innovative ways. In a really seminal 1996 article, he observed that while the numbers of democracy in the world had been dramatically increasing, there had been a much less substantial rise in the number of countries Freedom House rated as free. And this led him to draw the now widely accepted and applied distinction between merely electoral democracies on the one hand, which hold reasonably free and fair elections, but not much else, and truly liberal democracies, which also guarantee their citizens a high level of civil liberties and political rights. And Larry also is the source of other formulations that have become part of the standard vocabulary of discussions of democracy. With the recent, recent halting of global democratic progress, he was the first to say that the world had entered a democratic recession. This was the perfect label to apply to a situation in which democracy had stopped growing globally and was even beginning to show signs of outright decline. In recent years, the phrase democratic recession has been widely used, often with specific citations to Larry as its originator. Unfortunately, the phrase was starting to seem less applicable to the current rise of authoritarianism, uh, which threatened to turn the democratic recession into a depression. At least that's how things were looking until the world witnessed Ukraine's heroic resistance to Vladimir Putin's invasion, along with the remarkably unified response of Western and East Asian democracies. As the title of today's program uh, indicates, the current battle over Ukraine could represent a historical turning point 
in the global trajectory of democracy, thus paving the way for the democratic recession to be succeeded instead by a democratic recovery. Larry's more recent books reveal his capacity for addressing non-specialist readers. His own prose has always been crisp and clear, free of the jargon and abstraction that makes so much social science a chore to read. And the same qualities that made Larry an excellent writer helped make him a first-rate editor. When needed, he proved able to improve the structure of an article or even to render usable a piece that would otherwise have been unpublishable. And there were a few of those. <laughs> um, but he also could excel in, in line editing, and his marginalia were always worth uh, heeding. Now, I confess that I took the lead in curbing the length of articles and reducing the number of footnotes they contained. But Larry did share my aim of making the JOD, as we call the journal, more reader-friendly. Our goal initially was to reach, better reach non-academic readers serving in government or in NGOs. And the journal no doubt did attract some readers of this kind. But the biggest beneficiaries uh, of our editing articles for brevity, clarity, and accessibility were college students many of whom were assigned JODs articles in class, as Frank emphasized, and in some cases thanked us for their manageable length and overall readability. <laughs> so Johns Hopkins University Press published a series of some 30 of our books in the General Democracy book series. Um, as a result, the journal produced a little library of comparative democracy with some books devoted to individual countries and regimes, others to important thematic issues like economic reform and democracy or civil military relations and democracy. Today, due to the new ways students are able to access course materials, these kinds of edited volumes are no longer favored by the publishing industry. So it may well turn out that the staggering number of books Larry has edited I believe the content is over, the count is over 50. It probably will never be surpassed by future scholars of democracy. The number of articles and book chapters Larry's written probably reaches into the triple digits. He was certainly one of the journal's most prolific authors, and over the years he began writing for an even wider audience. His more popular books include Squandered Victory, the Spirit of Democracy, uh, and his latest, Ill Winds, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacencies. Moreover, he's a frequent contributor to publications on foreign affairs and to the op-ed pages of leading newspapers. Apart from his incredible productivity, I would have said that Larry's most notable characteristic is his extraordinary generosity. He has a very deep uh, and diverse set of friends, many based at Stanford, but others in Washington, and uh, they include democratic activists from a wide range of countries. When any of them are in difficulty, they know they can count on Larry to come to their aid. Somehow he also manages to find time for his current former and former students, many of whom, including the journal's current assistant editor, Justin Daniels, have joined the staff of the journal. Larry's always been a great favorite with the journal staff and has won the admiration of others, both at Ned and in the broader fields of democracy promotion. Um, I realized in listening to the other presentations that the most widely applied label to Larry was passion, his passion and how passionate he was. And uh, I think that's right. And I was puzzled as to why uh, uh, I uh, had admitted that. And maybe because I take it so much for granted. Mm -hmm. And you all heard it when Larry spoke. Uh, he brings not only to democracy, but everything he does, this deep, deep uh, passion. Uh, 
he doesn't share my own more skeptical temperament. Um, anyway, I fear that uh, my sketch has been too uh, agiographic anyway, but it's not easy to find negative things to say about Larry. In fact, I racked my brain but came up with only two. <laughs> First, he's a rabid Dodger fan, totally unforgivable. Uh, and second, he takes way too many photos on his travels. <laughs> These flaws may be severe, but they're far outweighed by his being a model of generosity, a true and dependable friend, a brilliant scholar, and a stalwart champion of democracy. So I can think of no one more deserving of Ned's Democracy Service Medal than my friend Larry Dine. Well, we have come to that part of the program where everything has been said, but not by everybody. Um, among those who are engaged in the global effort to protect, advance, and sustain human freedom and democracy, Larry, as has been said, stands alone. He's a scholar who researches these subjects a professor who teaches, a journalist and author who writes articles and books, an editor who collects and reviews the works of others, an advocate whose voice impacts leaders and policymakers and holds them to account. And he is a practitioner who shares experiences and expertise with democratic leaders and activists on the front lines. Oh, and I forgot he was once a government official or a government advisor, but that is another story, um, a story of truth-telling. He has done this all not only from his ivory tower, although there is not a more idyllic setting than the Stanford campus, but from his travels and interactions with Democrats on their territory. Damon and others have mentioned relationships and those forged and developed by Larry, which reminds me of, a, of an op-ed piece by David Brooks perhaps a decade ago, who was interviewing a youth leader and asking what programs turns young people around, disaffected young people around. And the answer was that the youth leader said that I have never seen a single program that has changed a young person. Relationships change people, not programs. Something Larry understands and acts upon. In short, Larry is consequential, making a real difference in people's lives because he makes you think and he makes you act a rare quality. In modern social media parlance, he is an influencer, but not for a product or a service, but for a cause and a mission. The endowment and its partners in every region of the world have been beneficiaries of Larry's knowledge, his intellect, his writings, his passion, and his deep and abiding commitment to shared values. The endowment, Larry, is pleased to recognize and to honor your many contributions with the Democracy Service Medal and to simply thank you for what you have meant to us and to so many others at home and abroad. Right 
I want to begin by saying the following, and this is a purely truthful statement. I got eight hours of sleep last night, and I feel absolutely great. I slept like a baby uh, anticipating this, but I could not have anticipated the, the warmth and generosity uh, of the remarks that have been made here. Uh, Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Carl. Thank you, all of you who've come, particularly Jim Abwadi and Alina Mungio PPD, who've come uh, from such a long distance uh, to be here uh, today. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Over the decades, no institution has meant more to me than the National Endowment for Democracy. And no cause has been dearer to me than Ned's mission to support the struggle for democracy and to help strengthen democratic institutions around the world. This is what Hannah Arendt called the most ancient cause of all, freedom versus tyranny. We are nearing the 40th anniversary next month of President Ronald Reagan's historic Westminster speech, which sparked the creation of the endowment. At a time when freedom has been retreating for a decade and a half, and so many people question the future of democracy, it is worth recalling Reagan's prescient words of defiant optimism. Now as then, there is, beyond everything else we've talked about today, a gathering crisis of totalitarian and authoritarian regimes. Look at how badly Russia has bungled and miscalculated in its invasion of Ukraine. But look at something else that we have really not discussed today. The unfolding disaster of China's failure to manage the COVID pandemic. Opting in panic to lock up its urban populations in what have become high rise prison camps without secure supplies of food and other essentials all because the regime refuses to admit its mistakes and, its inoculate, and inoculate its population with vaccines that work, the vaccines that were developed in the West. Both these disasters are the dis direct result of the increasing concentration of power in vain and isolated strongmen who brook no dissent and are trapped in their own echo chambers, advised by sycophants, and servile opportunists. In these unfolding tragedies, we see all over again the twin intrinsic vulnerabilities of authoritarian regimes, their relentless tendency toward the concentration of power and their inability to correct their mistakes through the marketplace of alternative ideas, open information, and competing parties. As President Reagan said in Westminster, None of these regimes is willing to risk free elections because they lack the confidence in their own, that word again, legitimacy. He added, regimes planted by bayonets do not take root, end quote. I am profoundly humbled to receive Ned's highest honor, the Democracy Service Medal, and to be among such heroic defenders of democracy and freedom as Lech Wałęsa, Lane Kirkland, Richard Luger, Václav Havel, the Dalai Lama, Madeleine Albright, George Shultz, and John McCain, and such enormously important scholars and theorists of democracy as Leczek Kolakowski, Francis Fukuyama, Jean Beth Gay Elshkdain, and my beloved mentor, Seymour Martin Lipset. I hope my receipt of this medal will be seen again as a reaffirmation of the vital role that ideas, research, and understanding play in the struggle to defend and advance democracy. When Mark Plattner and I prepared to launch the Journal of Democracy in 1989 with the passionate support of Carl Gershman, I could not imagine that my role in it would continue for 32 years. It was a labor of true love and the opportunity of a lifetime. So has been my ongoing role with the International Forum 
the Reagan Fussell Fellows Program, and the World Movement for Democracy. My deep association with Ned over these decades has made me both a better scholar of democracy and a more convinced believer that liberal democracy is, with all its flaws, the best form of government and the only way to secure the civil and political freedoms that are essential to human dignity. I am deeply grateful to all the dedicated and remarkable individuals who have served on the staffs, the senior leadership, and the boards of NED and its core institutes, too numerous to mention here. They have enriched my knowledge and they have inspired me. I owe a particularly strong debt to my partners in this mission for more than 32 years, Carl Gershman and Mark Plattner, who became not just colleagues, but treasured friends. I wanna pay tribute to the staff of the journal, particularly Phil Kostopoulos, who was with us from the beginning. Thank you, Phil. Uh, uh, and our immensely uh, able co-editors, Will Dobson and Tarek Masood, and our other editors, Tracy Brown, Brent Calmer, and Justin Daniels, as well as Mark's successor as Vice President for Research, Chris Walker, and Carl's successor as President, Damon Wilson. Our work goes forward in excellent hands. Human nature being what it is, the struggle for freedom and democracy will never be permanently won. This is a moment, as we have been discussing, of great danger, but also opportunity. If we worry and doubt, we should also take pride in all that we have achieved in these last four decades. As they say in Portuguese, la luta continua. Thank you. so much for those remarkable words and, mo and more importantly for the remarkable contribution to the cause, to the endowment. I just want to give a quick shout out as we wrap up to Melissa Aiton, to Ryan, Eric, uh, to Justin who's with us right here, Arian Gottlieb, Rochelle Faust, Jane Jacobson, Kate Wagner, Christine Bed uh, Bednard, Zach Evans, and Mike Dugan for helping make this evening possible. Thank you all. This concludes our program and we invite all of you here in person to join us on the roof to celebrate Larry. So thank you.